Welcome to the Weekly Squeak, your weekly geeky squeak with me, as always, Chris Chinchilla. Hopefully you can see me, hopefully you can hear me, or maybe you're reading me. Whatever format you like, it's fine with me. Just uh, if you like what you hear, see, read, then please share, rate, review, send me feedback. Always appreciated. You can find more about me at christianchilla.com and about the show itself at slash podcasts on the same website. And in grand fashion, just as I've started recording, something loud is happening in the background. So we'll see how well that comes out or not from the recording. Anyway, I have a few links for you. And then I have an interview with Planet Scale with Jitin uh, Vaidya and Sugu Sugumarani from Planet Scale, a um, developer tool platform. I'm not quite sure how to describe these things sometimes. That helps you scale uh, MySQL on, um, on Kubernetes, which has anyone ever tried to scale traditional databases on Docker, Kubernetes, things like that? It's traditionally been somewhat difficult. So we talk about that in the interview. But first, my links for the week. First is an article from Matthew McDonald on the Young Coda publication on Medium. Actually, about a month ago. I'm not quite sure why it's taken me this long to, to look at it and want to feature it. But it's an article entitled Mozilla, the greatest tech company left behind. So Mozilla has not had a good year. Uh, they have had to uh, have several rounds of layoffs, including their very, very well known and respected, especially in my kind of tech writer circles, MDN, the Mozilla Developer Network team. Um, and the interesting thing is always, I think the problem that Mozilla has is that a significant part of its revenue comes from its biggest rival being Google. And Google has kind of uh, basically through a, uh, a search tie-in deal through the, the Firefox browser. And uh, Google has been leaving this uh, signing, renewing this deal um, later and later and later each time it's due for renewal, kind of thus leaving Mozilla in a constant concern and its other attempts to monetize have not necessarily gone massively according to plan. Things like uh, Pocket. Um, I did have Pocket Premium for a while, uh, actually through a, a different, through another um, service that gave it to me for free as part of that. And I didn't necessarily find any reason to keep it. It's VPN services. I mean, they're probably a bit late to that game, I guess. And if you're doing in browser VPNs, you have options like Tor. And to be honest with you, Firefox and Tor users probably crossover a little bit. So I would guess that um, a lot of them wouldn't know how to use it. So why use something else maybe? I I'm not sure. And I guess it's this ongoing problem that many um, open source companies have is that a lot of people don't really understand or don't, don't really see a need to have to pay for something they can get for free. So when the same company tries to get you to pay for other things, maybe that mindset is still there. Maybe this is a problem they've always had. And this article is quite a nice history of um, how Mozilla got to where it is way back in Netscape Navigator days. I do remember using that on my Mac way back in, oh, who knows, Mac OS 7, 8, 9, I can't remember. And then they open sourced it to become Firefox. But then it actually has, I think this is the interesting thing with, with Mozilla. They have other quite interesting projects, but monetizing them is difficult. So they have Rust. Rust is used actually in a lot of places, including Firefox itself, um, but also some other places, um, and people like it. HTML5, I don't know if I could really claim that Mozilla created HTML5. They were part of the, the bodies that did. Um, they don't really have any kind of single ownership over it, I suppose, and they definitely can't really monetize that. ASM.js is not something I was familiar with. Um, but it has now led to WebAssembly, possibly again pushing it out the way a little bit. Who knows? Uh, the MDN, the, the network that was just taken down, the developer network that's very well respected in kind of um, my field, especially. I've met actually quite a few of their team. Um, and people would often, I think people would often find themselves on the MDN website when they were looking for web development type terms. But how do you monetize that? The problem so many sites now are having is all the information is available elsewhere for free. So trying to get people to either pay or tolerate advertising. And again, a lot of people in this space tend to have ad blockers is again difficult. Uh, this is a whole wider conversation, of course. Um, 
And then it talks about what did kill Mozilla. Mozilla is blaming COVID-19, but I find that as a slightly lazy excuse, especially the early um, waves of layoffs. Um, if your company is so reliant on revenue that it cannot last more than a month without it, that's kind of a sign that things were not that great already. Um, it's also a digital company. Plenty of other digital companies have actually done very well during this period. So I actually think there's other reasons. This article again mentioned, so 90% of Mozilla's funds come from this deal with Google, which is in, makes them incredibly reliant on this. Uh, some could argue that um, why Google wants to keep them around. I don't know. Um, I guess they get revenue from it themselves. I'm not sure. We can also look here. There's a good chart of the um, decline of the browser share from a high of around high 20% down to the lines get a bit muddy down the bottom, but down to now about less than 10%, I think, which is still a lot of users, but far below, yes, Chrome. Chrome is insanely high, I think, sometimes. And Safari even does better, bearing in mind that most people are using that on one platform. Um, and yeah, they've had a lot of uh, expensive bad ideas over the past few years. But um, anyway, and there is a call to arms down the bottom of the post about maybe donating. I don't know if you can make up for 400 million, but you can try. Um, <laughs> I think that yes, 400 million a year from Google. Maybe you can help chip into that. Next is an article by William Ralston on Wired. Bosses are doing weird things to get people back in the office. Um, obviously, this relates somewhat to the story that everything seems to relate to right now. Um, and this is actually, so this is from Wired UK. So this is sort of specifically about London, which I guess for me is interesting because I grew up there. Also, it's much closer to me here than it is the US and places like in the cities in the US. But um, I think London is also an example of a very centralized city. Lots of people come from the out in, and that has been somewhat, uh, that model has been completely trashed, obviously, over the past few months. And the government and, and managers kind of want to people, people to get back into the office, but it's hard to encourage them to do so. Now, some of this is public transport, which is valid, um, although I have my own personal feelings on this. Although London Underground is a lot stuffier and more enclosed than, say, public transport here. Um, interestingly, this contradicts some other things I've heard. I find the media coverage on the desire for people to work from home to be interesting because there's a big group of people who live in nice big houses and have lots of greenery around them and have lots of space who are quite happy to work from home. More so in the US, definitely, and maybe some other places that have similar kind of housing arrangements. Um, and it's not necessarily a glamour, but it's fine. You have space and comfort. But I did cover an article a while back from The Guardian, another English newspaper, talking about how in cities like London, New York, uh, Paris, not so much Berlin actually, but these medium to high density large cities where people live on top of each other a lot, this is not so nice to work from home. You don't have any space. You don't see anybody. Um, there's nowhere to escape from. You're often in house shares with lots of other people in the same situation. So interestingly, some things you read say that some people are desperate to go back to the office and then other things you read say they're not. And I sometimes wonder if the discussion is being somewhat forced by the media when there's, I know here, for example, a lot of people have gone back to the office, although it is somewhat different here. Berlin is not centralized. Public transport has a lot more space. You can ride a lot easier. Um, to where you need to be because you often tend to be closer to where you want to go, things like that. But anyway, this article, that's kind of the meta discussion. This article talks about some of the things that some companies in London are doing to try to get people back into the office. Playing on, um, playing on, laying on private transport taxes and things like that for them and working out that that is um, actually worth it. I don't know how you could do that at scale. I don't know if there's even enough taxes and traffic. I mean, London traffic is bad enough. It's probably not so bad right now. Um, and it's still not necessarily working. Um, maybe other English cities are different. I'm not sure. Um, and this is causing very big problems to central areas, and especially in London, but other large cities as well. So how do you get people back? I mean... I have my own office 
again, this is in Berlin. Um, co-working spaces here are mostly fairly busy again. Um, but then I guess people with co-working spaces were the people who wanted to get out from working from home in the first place. That's kind of the situation you've always been in. Um, and what will it take to get people back more full on? I think there's a lot of inconvenience at the moment. It's not just the public transport. When you get to the offices, all these things you have to do and things you have to follow, which kind of, it's like a, a lot of things at the moment. It's, it somewhat dispels the fun of doing it in the first place if there's so much preparation you have to do. So I don't really know how that's going to work in the medium to long term. But um, have a look. And yeah, would you go back to the office? Let me know your thoughts. Um, ChristianChiller.com. You can find my contact details there. Twitter at Chris Chinch is probably one of the quickest ways. Or any of the comments of where you have uh, read, seen, heard the show. Next, uh, getting into open source world a little bit. This is an article from Stephen J. Vaughan's Nichols, as always, on ZDNet. Um, talking about the canonical CEO, Mark Shuttleworth, makes peace with the Ubuntu Linux community. Now, actually, this is mostly, there's a couple of interesting things here. This is mostly in regard to the Ubuntu Community Council, that when John O'Bacon, an infamous community expert, his book on um, uh, art of community, I think it's called, is a very famous book on community management, especially in the tech space. And uh, since he left um, a few years ago, or six years ago, the, the community council has somewhat disbanded. I think this somewhat unfortunately proves that quite often these sorts of efforts often need some sort of benevolent dictator slash cat herder to actually keep things going. And this is one interesting thing that is mentioned here that I kind of sparked my interest having worked in a lot of similar environments is that there's often a lot of discussion around uh, wanting these things to happen, but when it comes to actually getting people to do them, it's a whole other issue. And that is possibly why the councils are somewhat collapsed. And it wasn't that there was any kind of agenda to keep it that way. It just slipped to the bottom of priorities. But then, of course, over time, people start to say, well, what happened? And is there some other agenda? I mean, there never was. It was probably just that it didn't happen and people forgot about it because there wasn't a strong enough personality, in this case, actually an employee, of Canonical to push it forward. Well, now it has started to come back together again in a slightly different way, um, hopefully without the need for that um, that benevolent dictator slash cat herder or the one person to do it, and we'll see what happens. I mean, Ubuntu is one of the, is no, is the biggest Linux distribution, so it probably deserves some community oversight um, that isn't just the kind of, from a coding perspective. And finally, also in open source, I'll just make the font a little bit bigger there. This, this article I found slightly almost, I don't know if it's depressing, but a bit gloomy. Uh, this is David Jeans on Forbes, CEO of 4.5 billion Confluent, the company behind uh, Kafka. The future of open source will be bought, not built. So the, the positive intention of this article is to say that developers won't need to always build from scratch in the future. I would say the CEO of this company is being somewhat naive when he says that because um, developers haven't necessarily had to build from scratch for a long time, but they like to, <laughs> um, which is a whole other conversation. And he's saying that in the future, a company like or product project like Confluent Cloud and Kafka needn't be built from scratch and um, needn't be built, but you can just assemble it from components. I mean, this is kind of what open source already is. I mean, they're using Java. They're probably using various uh, plugins and, and things like that anyway. I sort of, so I find this an interesting article that I can't quite figure out how to take because it's almost also saying that they're not doing anything very interesting <laughs> that you could do it yourself from other components. So it's a strange sort of article where it's hard to know quite what his um, perspective on the opinion is. Um, because it somewhat reflects some of what kind of happens and some of what would be worrying if it happened and, and a whole bunch of interesting things. But anyway, give me your thoughts on that. I would like to, um, to, to hear your opinions on that. And especially, I think Confluent is one of those large open source vendors that attracts some controversy sometimes. So let me know what you think. And coincidentally, I did have an interview with Confluent Cloud on the podcast not so long ago. So have a look at christangilla.com slash podcast to find that. 
Okay, so that was my links for the week. Now is my interview with Jitten and Sugu from Planet Scale. Enjoy. So my name is Jitin Vaidya, and uh, Subhu and I have known each other for about 25 years. We worked together at uh, Informix Software back in the early 90s mm -hmm. for the first time. And uh, he left Informix to join X.com, which later became PayPal. Mm -hmm. And uh, he joined YouTube a couple of months before YouTube was acquired by Google. And in the meantime, I had joined Google in 2005 in the search quality team. And uh, he knew that I was at Google and he pulled me into YouTube. And uh, we both ended up working together at YouTube from 2007 to 2012. Mm -hmm. And uh, YouTube was really seeing a lot of growth. YouTube's databases needed to be scaled. And that's how Vitesse, the open source project on which our company is based, was born. Um, I managed the SRE and DBA teams at YouTube. And Sugu, with another uh, early engineer at YouTube, was the uh, lead on Vitesse from a development point of view. And uh, so we started uh, Planet Scale in early 2018 mm -hmm. to basically um, provide, make it easy for people to deploy, manage, and monitor Vitesse clusters uh, commercially. And uh, these, our company was incorporated about a week after YouTube donated Vitesse to Cloud Native Computing Foundation, mm -hmm. and now it's one of the graduated projects. Um, we have raised about $25 million in venture capital, three from Signal Fire and 22 from A16Z. Peter Levin from A16Z is on our board. Mm -hmm. We are about 35 uh, employees now today, um, mostly in the Bay Area, but distributed all around the world, uh, India, Israel, Europe, um, and so on, Canada. Um, and uh, that's pretty much a quick summary of us as well as the company. I have worked at uh, YouTube, Google, Dropbox, and a stint at uh, the USDS, the United States Digital Service uh, in Washington, D.C. Um, and I'll let Sugu add if he wants to add anything to that. Oh, this is all good. <laughs> <laughs> but, so... It sounds like uh, the the core behind Planet Scale, I'm guessing that's mostly Vitesse on the open source side, has been around for some time. And that's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we started the project in 2010. Uh, when we actually started it, there was no intent for uh, anybody else to use it. We just open sourced it, but it was mostly for us to use it ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, it's only around 2014 or 15 when uh, other companies started noticing it and started <laughs> wanting to use it. Okay, fair um, enough, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so before we get into the details of what it actually is, so why in 2018 did you decide, decide to uh, start a company behind it? So we actually started thinking about a company as early as late 2016 mm -hmm. because that was when Sugu and I went and gave presentations at Square and at Slack. Mm -hmm. And uh, I distinctly remember this when Sugu was talking to Slack, his argument to them was instead of buy versus build, why don't you 
quote unquote buy and build mm-hmm. as if rather than reinventing the wheel invest in the open source project vitess which already solves these problems that you want to solve and build out the features that it doesn't have with us um and uh, that really appealed to them they started their project in late 2016 now about 80% of slacks database traffic runs on vitess so it was around that time that subu and i started talking about uh starting a company because people were already starting to ask if there was an entity that they can use for having support mm-hmm. especially I, i think the early queries came from companies in asia who were uh, leery about deploying open source software by themselves and they wanted somebody that they could hold responsible for yeah. for right and uh, the reason that we waited for another year is that in early 2017 we talked to the founders of heptio uh which was the kubernetes company yeah. and they told us that it might make sense for us to get youtube to donate vitess to cncf before we started the company mm-hmm. and uh, our estimate for how long would th- that process take inside youtube was a little optimistic so we thought that it was going to get back in the house <laughs> six months but it took longer than that but that also gave me the opportunity to go and serve in washington dc mm-hmm. so in the end it all worked out well So it's interesting I I've worked in the database space for some on and off for a little bit of time or I've been to a few CNCF events but I haven't come across Vitess before so let's actually dig in I don't know how I've managed to miss it even though and the promise is is quite an interesting one so let's actually dig into what it is um so the the first opening line is a database clustering system for horizontal scaling of MySQL through sharding So a, let's unpack that a little bit. Obviously there's a few terms there that will be familiar to to some. But yep. um let's go into a little bit more detail about what that actually means. Okay. So I will take the first crack at crack <laughs> at it and so can again jump yep. in. Um so another way to describe Vitess is sharding middleware. Yeah. Right? So those companies who are running out of capacity for a single monolithic mysql or any database really don't have anywhere to go but to shard and yeah. sharding basically means that you split your data with identical schema across multiple databases right and typically what companies end up doing is that they end up solving this problem in app yeah. so in your application you have logic which says that if the user id is between 0 to 100 million go here 100 million to 200 million go there right and as you can imagine that uh, that logic and having to maintain that layer in your application uh, reduces your uh, release velocity because every new feature that you're building needs to be aware that you are talking to a sharded system rather than a database which mm-hmm. is how you typically develop so what we did is that we encapsulated all that sharding complexity in vitess so um, you tell vitess how you want your data sharded Vitess gives you a, a MySQL binary protocol, so your application just connects to Vitess as though it's talking to a MySQL database, mm-hmm. and it can pretend that it's talking to a single huge monolithic database when you could be there could be underlying two shards, eight shards, sixty-four shards, two hundred and fifty-six shards. You, you don't care, right? Um, so sharding middleware is one way to think about it, and MySQL compatible because we in the backend each shard. is a traditional mysql cluster with a with a master and replicas um so the data is actually being uh saved we use inodb as the engine underneath those mysql databases so the data is being saved in mysql format right so our sort of promise to our users is that your query path will always be open source so vitess is open source mysql is open source mm-hmm. and mysql compatible um so horizontal scaling is sort of the sort of one a uh, value proposition of vitess but the second and the one that is becoming more important is that we use vitess to be able to run youtube's mysql databases in google's borg infrastructure yeah the, which is the uh pre predecessor and the blueprint for kubernetes mm-hmm. and uh, to do that i mean in in an environment in an orchestration system like that you cannot take the longevity of the master for granted and uh, what that means is that you have to really solve the replica to master to replica failover story you have to really solve the service discovery story and you have to really solve the observability story 
And we did all that so that we could run uh, databases under Borg. And because of that, it runs really well in Kubernetes. And uh, HubSpot and JD.com have been using Vitesse to run their databases in Kubernetes for the last two and a half to three years. Mm -hmm. And all of PlanetscaleDB's database as a service is also built on top of Kubernetes. So that's sort of the second value prop. Yeah. Um, yeah. For I'd like to get on to planet scale in a bit more detail in a minute, but just just to just to understand, it's been it's been some time since I've done much with my my SQL databases, <laughs> uh, and unless I'm mistaken, they don't by default they still don't support anything like sharding themselves. This is why you're adding such a unique point on top. That's yeah. that's yeah. right. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah. actually the. Um, the bigger point is, uh, which is more relevant today, is a MySQL database by itself cannot be cloud native. Yeah, uh, you yeah. cannot just take MySQL and run it in Kubernetes. Yeah, and that was actually uh, uh, the big argument that took place when uh, when we uh, at YouTube wanted to donate with us to CNCF. The argument was, <laughs> why is the database trying to be cloud native? It does. Just yeah, yeah, it yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah, yeah. I actually a few years back did work uh, on on the on a team for a, uh, a database that was trying to be container native at the time, not really cloud native, and it was always even not even that long ago. It's like, oh well, databases just don't work. Databases just don't work. <laughs> um, and just to understand, does it does it support any other? kind of traditional database like Postgres or anything like that, or is it just MySQL? At the moment, it's just MySQL. Okay. But just the way the way it is architected, there is nothing to stop us from supporting Postgres. Mm -hmm. But um, it, it's going to be a, a lose, we will lose focus if we decide yeah, yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And I mean, the other interesting thing here that sparks in my mind and some of the the, the companies that you've mentioned who are users, I'm almost surprised to hear because I would think that some of them were just never even using MySQL in the first place. But <laughs> but I suppose um, that, that there's maybe still more doing that for various legacy reasons or it just suits the rest of the application they use or something like that. Uh, yeah. I, I think in general, MySQL is probably the database that is used by web scale companies. Huh compared to Postgres. I mean, Postgres is becoming more and more popular, but I really don't know anybody who runs a real scale, uh, runs it at real scale in production uh, backends. I, I may be mistaken. I mean, there may there may be companies who have recently come up for doing it. Yeah. But the last time I heard was that Uber had decided to do it and then they migrated out of Postgres into MySQL again. I mean, I was thinking the whole NoSQL world, but I, I suppose you... You know, NoSQL has its limitations. Um, and Correct. That's, so yeah. NoSQL was initially invented to get around the limitation of relational databases that they can't scale yeah. horizontally, the, right? You can't throw machines at it and uh, have it scale. And but but you are giving up transactions, you are giving up secondary indexes, yeah. Yeah. you are giving up transactional semantics in general. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Over the last 10 years, Mongo has built some of those things yep. on. Despite what yeah. many offer, they're still, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so planet scale. Um, what's the what's the time difference between Vitesse and planet scale? Like, did they both basically come at the same time or did you add planet scale a bit later? So planet scale, as I said, started in early 2018. Yeah. Which was, you know, fairly late. Vitesse has, had already been a well-established uh, project yeah, accepted okay. by UNCF and so on. And uh, at Planet Scale, we are building uh, a database as a service on top of Vitesse. Mm -hmm. right? So uh, we call it Planet Scale DB. And uh, we chose Kubernetes as the platform on which we built the service. And uh, today it is live on AWS, GCP, and Azure. Mm -hmm. And because we chose to build it on Kubernetes, we can treat regions across these three clouds fairly uniformly. And you just get access to these 12 regions across three clouds in US East, US West, Asia, and Europe. And you can um, deploy your databases, single sharded or multi sharded, 
with masters in one region and replicas in another. So for example, you could have your masters in AWS US East and replicas in Asia Pac yep. uh, Azure if you wanted to. So we call that true multi-cloud databases. Yep. So as far as you are concerned, you can treat them all the same. People are more mainly interested in this for disaster recovery and for not being locked into a sin, sing, single cloud vendor, yeah. right? Um, and the second second thing that we have done, which is that because we built on top of Kubernetes, we allow you to treat your own Kubernetes clusters as custom regions mm -hmm. in Planet mm -hmm. So the idea is that let's say that you are running a Kubernetes cluster on OpenShift in your own data center and you are not interested in entrusting your data to us. We allow you to give us access to your Kubernetes cluster, and you still use our control plane to say that, hey, give me a database which is eight shards. Each shard should have one master and four replicas. These are the resources associated with each replica. But when you say click, when you click deploy, rather than those pods getting started in our network perimeter, they get started in your Kubernetes cluster. Mm -hmm. So the data never leaves your Kubernetes cluster. But uh, you know, we, we configure backups for you. We configure Grafana. We configure Prometheus. So that it's, it's basically exp you experience a hosted database service without the data ever leaving your Kubernetes cluster. So we call it BYOK or planet scale. OK, so these, this is the main differences between you have your planet scale for Kubernetes and planet scale cloud. Cloud is That's that you do it planet scale for Correct. kubernetes is a combination of <laughs> yeah exactly. Exactly. okay okay yeah. and so what do you what do you uh, add uh, with planet scale to to vitess what what else are you adding to that enterprise offering so uh, the the general principle is that we we don't have our own custom binaries of vitess mm -hmm. that we run okay. we run vitess binaries that are from, from the open source. Again, the promise being that your query path will always be open source. Mm -hmm. But what we give you is an easy way uh, to take backups and you know, backups, restores, one click resharding, um, just the ease in deployment. And uh, soon, what we will be uh, rolling out is a better integration with your CI CD workflows and the whole, you know. You have 200 developers who need a dev environment, but same, you know, sharded databases, but with very little resources. Everybody should have their own. You have a staging environment where you, you, you need it across two regions and a prod environment, which is actually distributed across four regions, FT instances, and so on. So managing that and managing the workflow of, uh, you know, um, promoting your schema and B schema from dev to staging and staging to production and all of those, those are th that's on the roadmap. And I think those are the features which will really differentiate us from a lot of folks who are just doing hosted services. Okay. Okay. And then the other offering you have here, which is a sort of common one to add in, is the enterprise. So I'm guessing is this on-premise or something else? Right. So yeah. it's not on premise, it's still for Kubernetes, but it's both front end and back end running in your own oh. your own VPC. Okay. Okay. So it's not, you're never in a multi tenant environment. You're always okay. in a single tenant. Yeah. I'd like to dig in a bit more to this planet scale for Kubernetes. That seems kind of interesting. Um mm -hmm. how does that look from a kind of DevOps user experience, dev experience? Excellent yeah, question. operator experience, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> yeah, excellent question, right? So the, the way, uh, what you do is you still go to console.planetscale.com, which is our hosted service. Mm. And uh, we give you the ability to define a region. So currently it's in beta. So the UI is not very well baked, but you know there are six customers who are already trying mm -hmm. this out. So it all works. Uh, more polish is coming. But the idea is that you start defining your own region mm -hmm. and the first step in that is that you download a script that you that you run with credentials to your kubernetes cluster so you are in your terminal your cube config points to your whichever cluster you want to run these databases in and you run this you run this script mm -hmm. and what this script does is that it creates you you can give a namespace as a command line parameter to this script 
And what it does is that it creates certain RBAC and certain roles in that namespace, which will be used by us. And, and it gathers the authentication information and it outputs all of that for you uh, in, in a very easily understandable form. And it asks you to copy and paste that into our UI, right? And you copy and paste that. And now our cluster manager binary can now start making calls to your Kubernetes API server. Mm -hmm. And so you use our UI to, as I said, give me a database with eight shards. E each shard should have, uh, you know, uh, one master, four replicas. So that translates to, let's say, eight times five equal to 40 pods, right? So when you say deploy, our Kubernetes server is making a call to your API server and says, hey, deploy these 40 pods. The API server is going to say that I have no idea what planet scale is, but there seems to be this operator that is running, which has registered this class with me. Let me pass all of this to that binary. And that binary in turn says, okay, now give me 40 pods. Each pod should have one MySQL D, one VT tablet. And so VT tablet is a My, uh, Vitesse binary. And it's it's pulling all that from a registry to which we have given you access. Mm -hmm. So registry is hosted by us outside of your network perimeter. The APS, our uh, cluster manager UI is hosted by us outside of your network perimeter. But we are making calls into your Kubernetes API server and asking you to create all these things. And so the databases, and and we you know we we do the whole thing right. We start these uh, database pods. We stick VTGate is our stateless uh, proxy that does uh, sharding, routing, routing related to sharding as well as MySQL binary protocol. So we start a bunch of those. We stick a service in front of it. If you have configured and asked for an external load balancer, we stick that there. Otherwise, we assume that your uh, app servers are, will be running in the same. Uh, the same Kubernetes cluster, um, in which case they can just connect to the service, right? Uh, we start Grafana, we start Prometheus, um, and we, we populate these uh, uh, graphs for you. Also, when you are defining that region, we do credentials for a S3 compatible uh, object store. Mm -hmm. um, that can be either a new server that you are running in your uh, Kubernetes cluster or adjacent to your Kubernetes cluster, or it could be an external S3 bucket that you have created or whatever. We just ask you for that. And then we uh, set up backups for the pods that we have started in your Kubernetes mm -hmm. cluster. And then they, they all the automation around creating the backups, validating the backups, uh, starting new replicas based on the backups, all of that is again managed by us but the actual backups are being created in S3 compatible storage that you have configured. Yeah. Okay. Right? So actually, one thing we forgot to touch on earlier that maybe I should have got into a bit more detail that just interested me looking at the, the sort of architecture overview you have on this planet scale for Kubernetes is yeah. I understand what planet scale is doing, but in the sort of Kubernetes setup, and we already alluded to this around that databases were never ideal for containers and Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. Where What's happened to MySQL here? Where's MySQL running? Is it running in Kubernetes as well, or can it run elsewhere, or is it up to the, the user? Or So in this setup, this particular setup, and the way we run it in the uh, multi-tenant hosted service, Kubernetes binaries themselves are running in Kubernetes. Um, so I would point you to uh, a, an architecture diagram of Vitesse itself, mm. uh, if one is available. Let me just quickly uh, see if I can give you a URL on our uh, website. I think um, I might have just found it, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So if you can see that each, what we call a Vitesse tablet is yeah. a MySQL D and a VT tablet combination, yeah. right? And uh, we start a single pod in which those two run side by side as containers and talk to each other over a Unix socket. Okay. Right. But that MySQL D doesn't need to be at, I mean, you, you can have that MySQL D be an RDS Aurora or an RDS MySQL or a Google Cloud SQL. Anything that is SQL compatible backend can be served, you know, at, then in that case, that VT tablet will talk to it over a TCP IP socket mm -hmm. rather than the mm -hmm. common socket. Right. So that is possible. Our backend operator, which does all this, does it. And uh, we allow you to run that way with 
our uh, planet scale db as a in, that, in some sense a proxy in front of an externally hosted database mostly for testing and later for migration and so on yeah okay. but uh, but the kubernetes product for the time being doesn't allow you to do that okay. and there isn't a ui we don't expose that in the ui yeah so just to understand something you said there that mm-hmm does mean that you can migrate from a traditional MySQL cluster and you migrate to the kind of planet scale architected MySQL cluster, or right. you don't have to, but you, it's probably best if you do, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. you, you said it better than I yeah. did. Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. All right, good. This is making sense. <laughs> Should have touched on that earlier, really, but okay. (laughs) So, um, obviously, it looks like the uh, Kubernetes um, offering is is reasonably recent in in about the past sort of two months. Um, What else is on the roadmap for the next next six months? So, uh, some of the things that are on the roadmap are... Uh, well, if, if you have to think about the categories of it, it's ease of use and migration tools. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, one of them is what we call, so in migration tools, there are two things coming. One we call link, which is this ability to run us as a proxy in front of an external hosted database. And the second that we call sync, mm-hmm. which is to st- uh, start databases in us and start replicating from your external database into us. And uh, so when with with the ability to migrate without any application downtime, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Like that you continue to write to your external database, but it's getting sync, yeah, you know, yeah. get it to us. And with a few second uh, downtime, you can now start sending traffic to us directly. Okay. Um, yeah, makes so the sense. Link, yeah. Right. So link and sync are two things that are coming. The third thing that is coming is uh, sort of what we call uh, one-click resharding. Um, <laughs> So yeah. this whole, I mean, you might start with a multi-terabyte monolithic database. So if you read the, say, for example, the uh, blog post that Square did about their Vitesse experience, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty entertaining uh, a series of blog posts. And their main engineer, uh, Yoon, he's, he's actually a, a, a Swede. And uh, I, I, I often joke to him that that actually reads better than, you know, Nordic noir. <laughs> there is a lot of suspense there. <laughs> so uh, the long story short, um, they had this huge monolithic database taking a lot of QPS. And yeah. the first resharding, they were very, um, uh, very nervous, understandably, about whether the resharding was going to work and whether Vitess was going to be able to do all this um and now we are taking all that functionality and we are going to allow you to reshard with one click mm-hmm. uh, you just double the number of uh, your infrastructure also i don't know whether you saw the tweet from the ceo of um, slack where he called out I and mean, he was talking the main thread was about the their response to coronavirus and how they needed to um figure out how you know the employee morale as well as infrastructure uh beef up the infrastructure to deal with the new new traffic yeah. but one thing where he called us out was that you know helping them with their database infrastructure so that they doubled their database infrastructure number of shards in about nine days mm-hmm. um yeah. and uh the, yeah. the, the, something that would not have been possible without vitess without our technology so one click resharding is one more thing that is coming uh eventually we want to get to a point where people don't even have to worry about the fact that they're talking to a sharded database. Uh, we ask them higher level questions about how, how their data is organized and how much okay, QPS yeah, they want yeah. and what their, what their budgets are. And we manage the database under the hood for them completely. But I would like to point out one way in which Vitess is different than other sharded databases, which is that we give you a lot of control and we allow you to co-locate uh, related data. So, for example, okay. yeah, right. So, if you have a user table and an orders table, and user, you use, you say, okay, shard the user table using its ID. 
there are millions of uh, orders but instead of sharding the orders table using its id table we say you can chart that table using the user id column which is a foreign key into that table and that way the row uh, 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 in the user table for a particular user and that user's orders in the order table all are live in the yeah. same shard yeah so a majority of your queries end up being queries and transactions being end up being single transact to single shard transactions and that that gives us advantages that a lot of other sharded or distributed databases that just randomly shard your data don't get right so we we do need to we do need you as a developer to put some thought into co-location of the data but at planet scale we want to make it as easy as possible rather than current way of doing it which is you have to craft this json file that tells us how it works okay and this i mean this this opens up a few possibilities this opens up the ability i guess to do things like uh geolocation based charting yeah. as well for things like yeah. gdpr or whatever um exactly. but also you're starting to kind of <laughs> strangely drag mysql into a sort of a sort of like graph like world as well <laughs> ever so slightly but um you know we want to run it that way yeah i mean yeah. what we want to sort of uh, get to is that you know mysql is a 20 year old database yeah. that has served the web uh, data, you know web well and planet scale wants to we will be the next 20 years of mysql <laughs> <laughs> give it a new lease of life yeah. <laughs> so, so, i think that was a nice ending quote but anyway <laughs> um is there anything else you want to mention you want to make sure that is mentioned um that we haven't covered so i touched upon this but i think uh, what what is going to be really useful is the you know thinking about how databases are administered not yeah. just okay, yeah yeah the whole dev staging prod yeah. uh, and ci cd pipelines and the modern software development and how databases relate to that um that that is something that we are really thinking about yeah now that's interesting and some of what you said there is an interesting point uh, and I've done other interviews with with companies that are trying to do sort of um, bring in DevOps processes to to database operators. But then if you just abstract that anyway, then they don't even have to think like that. A database administrator can think like a database administrator, but not like a DevOps person. So, <laughs> so yeah, it's kind I think of the, the one thing I can add is uh, the way. Um, People, the way software development has evolved, has changed. Um, developers want databases to kind of run by themselves. Yeah. They don't want these administrators, uh, DBAs uh, and stuff. So they just want things to run on autopilot, as yeah. they call it. And uh, so that is basically kind of what we bring is uh, that take that pain away so that you don't have to worry about managing the database or managing the people that manage the database <laughs> <laughs> a very uh, developer centric view of how data is these yeah. people keep asking me questions <laughs> and they leave me alone <laughs> cool all right good um and of course i mean planet scale is a commercial product you do have a try for free option i can see there that's right but then if people want to play if developers want to play with the underlying technology, they can also experiment with Vitesse anyway. So you kind of have two options there. And that was my interview with Jitten and Sugu from PlanetScale. Hope you enjoyed that. So a few small updates from me since last week, and a lot since last week, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, I did a Dexpose with uh, Insomnia, which is an open source API um, debugger, designer now part of Kong, but still open source. And the next expose, which I'm going to be recording right after this, is going to be with PlanetScale. Um, not that I can tell you to go and watch it, because by the time this comes out, it'll already happen, but you can go and watch it on uh, YouTube and uh, Twitch. You can find the details on my website, christianchiller.com. Solo Adventure is taking a slight break. In fact, I was even contemplating uh, Dexpose taking a slight break because I need to rejig 
some tooling and automation around the tooling, which I'm going to be doing this week. So there'll actually be a lot of smoothing of some of the experiments I've been having over the next uh, few weeks. I do have um, a new article that just went out on DZone with me experimenting with uh, Flutter, um, which is not on my website yet, as you can see. If you haven't listened to the last podcast episode, then you can hear Christian Nunziato talking about Palumi, his book on Palumi, Palumi in Action. There's some discount codes there, so go and check that out. Um, no other massive updates on new projects quite yet. I'm going on a creative writing weekend this weekend, so there will be some more soon. We're going to be putting out some new episodes of Stories About People and Board Game Jerk very soon. And what else? There's something else, um, bum, 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 which I cannot remember for the life of me. I'm sure there's some other, <laughs> some other, there's some other content publishing soon, actually. Yes, one on uh, versioning Kubernetes configuration with Humanitech. That's also coming out soon. But I have been mostly working behind the scenes on all of documentation work for Chronosphere slash M3. So have a look there to see what, well, it's all on GitHub right now, but <laughs> you'll see stuff in progress. So there'll be lots of changes coming next week after my creative weekend. But in the meantime, please go to chrischinchilla.com. Please rate, review, share um, wherever you consumed this content. And until next time, thank you very much for joining me.